Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, your weekly discussion of motoring news. This is episode 508 on Wednesday, the 11th of January, 2023. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. And this week we'll be watching cities flex their legislative muscles. (laughs) I'll be trying not to lose my cool over security twice. And we discover a slice of Mulvan in Nashville. Sorry, I've just got to congratulate you on putting that tongue twister in right as the first menu item <laughs> and making it on the first go. Just about. Just. <laughs> uh, should we jump into the new news, though, because there is no follow up? Uh, this is the beginning of the month and the end of the year. So that can only mean, Alan? Yes, it's the SMMT new car registration figures. Whee! I feel like uh, Kermit the Frog at the start of the Muppet show there. <laughs> overall, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about December just shortly and then come back to the year today. But overall, uh, for 2022, there was a 2% fall compared to 2021. That, obviously, at the moment, is being down to supply chain issues. With the way the economies are going globally, etc., then of course there's not that much certainty right at the moment because it could be that once the supply chain figures are, are solved, then we move into there being less demand overall potentially, given the rise in interest rates and all sorts of stuff. Alternatively, there could be so much pent up demand and people still wanting to go ahead with vehicles they've ordered that it could stay just fine for most of 2023. But because we don't have a time machine. That's just guesswork (laughs) or estimation, as it's also known. Let's skip ahead to December. Petrol is dominant as a fuel source. Uh, Obviously, having an electricity in the mix is very, very strong as well. So the market share for pure battery electric vehicles for December was 32.9%. Diesel dropping wildly, very, very low market share, 3.1% for December. Obviously, year-to-date figures are a little bit more leveled out. These are actually towards the extremities, uh, and we'll see why in just a moment uh, whenever we get to the bestsellers list. You'll never guess what. We're now at the bestsellers list. (laughs) And it's for sellers, but actually it's registers as us as us, but that doesn't look as good as the title of a table. I do wish they'd change it to something else, though. Coming in at number 10 at 1,782. So not particularly strong numbers this month. Generally, December's not not normally a big registration month because people have so many other things to spend their money on. I mean, really, we've got to wait until March, April before we start to get back to properly indicative numbers uh, in a year. If you're wondering why that is, it's because January is a short month because people are still on holiday at the start of it. February is a short month and then March is a new registration number. So it tends to gather up the January and February's and then April is a normal month again. Yeah. So uh, Ford Puma, 1,782 with one registration more at number nine is the (laughs) Nissan Leaf. Number eight is the Ford Fiesta. Number seven is the Volvo XC40. Crazy to think that Volvo XC models out registering a ford fiesta really number six is the take a drink toyota yaris to, with uh 2020 number five the volkswagen t-rock number four after a bit of a jump of about a thousand is the mini at 3313 number three is the nissan qashqai 3506 and there's obviously been a number of ships in because at number two is a Tesla Model 3 with 5,704. And at number one is Tesla Model Y with 10,664. But also on top of the boats being in. Which is impressive. China opening up from lockdowns. Yes, absolutely. Because European uh, Models 3 and Y do come from China, not the US. Mm-hmm. Uh, the... Many of these are pent up demand from quite a long time. I'm going to say a terrible thing, and people are going to accuse me of Tesla bashing, probably, but it's just because that many were registered in December. I do wonder how many were delivered in December. But hey, that's a different They're not question. the only one, though, as one of the articles last week. <laughs> last week, yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, that's pretty much across the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre, pre, pre registering. Yes. Because you don't know if they've registered as soon as they've got a VIN number. Yeah. Stellantis were called on it. 
but because they've got a dealer network. Others, their dealer networks may not be quite, if they have a dealer network, dealer networks may not be quite as vocal yeah. uh, on the subject. Yeah. I think that was fair and balanced. Yes, I think so. Do you want to just run through the quick full year top 10? Yeah, so for the full year, number 10, Ford Fiesta, 25,000. And 70. Number nine, Ford Cougar, 26,549. Uh, number eight, Volkswagen Golf, seven, Hyundai Tucson, six, the Kia Sportage. Number five, the Mini, 32,387. Number four, the Ford Puma, 35,088. Number three, the Tesla Model Y. Now, bear in mind that 10,664 of those were registered in the last month. Otherwise, it would not be on this list. No, it wouldn't. 35,551. Yes, the slow speaking was the mental arithmetic being done to work out if it was going to be number 10 or just below. Um, Number two, the Vauxhall Corsa with 35,910. And number one, the Nissan Qashqai, which gives us a bit of a late, bit of a late lead there, didn't it? It was it sort of uh, came in, in last, halfway through the year, uh, from the last half of the year. It, yeah, it, it was, really it was got an uptick, steady performance, and then accelerating, which is not something that people often say about Qashqai. Uh, for forty-two thousand seven hundred and four registrations in twenty twenty-two. Yep. Just a quick note, by the way. Uh, the Tristan Young's normal breakdown of vehicles by by what fuel you put into them. There's a link to the Broken News article in the, the show notes. Just to say over, I mean, market shares relatively steady with battery electric vehicle kind of taking up the market share from diesel. Yep. Um, petrol 67.5 percent market share battery electric vehicle for 2022 16.55 um, that's uh, as opposed to 11.58 last year diesel 9.6 percent market share as opposed to 14 percent last year plug-in hybrids roughly steady at 6.28 percent yep and that's kind of how it goes petrol battery diesel plug-in hybrid it's just a breakdown of, of fuels. Yeah. Also in that article is a really interesting couple of lists that show the volume changes and which manufacturers who sold uh, 5,000 or more cars in 2022 or registered them, who were up and who were down. It's actually a really fascinating list. Also, there's some explanation behind that as well and a bit more digging into that because what appears to be on the surface it should be so is not quite the case so if you're interested in all this stuff do go read the broken news article from tristan young because he does a really good job one last figure before we move on to the spreadsheet of doom Forty-two thousand seven hundred four cash guys registered in the uk last year there were forty-two thousand seven hundred and sixty-two transit customs that's the middle size transit registered so there were more of the mo- most popular van registered in 2022 than of the most popular passenger car yes spreadsheet of doom and i will doom quite quickly our bath down 70 percent alfa romeo down 29 percent bentley down 17 percent even though they had a record year mm-hmm. citroen down 32 percent uh dacia down 46 ds down 63 and fiat down nine uh, 32 not 90 32 percent <laughs> sorry i was making them much worse than they really were. <laughs> uh, Honda is down at 67%. Jaguar is down 32%. And again, these are all on 2021 figures. Mercedes-Benz is down 21%. Mini down at 15%. Peugeot down at 69%. Smart down at 49%. Subaru down 15%, which, okay, right. So 2021, that's 176 vehicles registered. 2022, 149. Okay, they're down 34% overall in the year, though. Yeah, that is true. And then the last company that went down significantly was Vauxhall down 45%. Alan, mm-hmm. cheer us up, because there is quite a bit of green, actually. There is. There's just quite a lot of vehicle within the sort of threshold this month. Uh, Alpine up 54%. Audi up 17%. Ford up 54%. Genesis up 1,381% from 11 to 163 cars. Well done. 
Uh, Jeep up 50, Kia up 19, Lexus up 134. That's good because they had a bad month last month. Mm. Mazda up 85%, MG up 160%, Nissan up 23, Polestar up 50, 155, Porsche up 38 uh, Renault up 131, Seat up 91, Tesla up 70, uh, Volkswagen up 48, and other British up 37.21. Uh, it's also worth giving an honourable mention to GM Aura, who, with 21 vehicles registered, have made their first ever entry into the new car registration spreadsheet of doom. Yes, looking forward to them fighting with Genesis for the MG monthly award of incredible percentage rises. I was worried where you were going there. I was looking forward to them fighting with Genesis, and I thought, that's a quite different market segment. <laughs> um, but yes, I, I see exactly what you mean. Anyway, uh, should we go to the first story that involves London, Andrew? <laughs> yes. This is the news that, as of the 1st of January, newly registered or new registered private hire vehicles now have to have zero emission capabilities. That means that they need to either emit no more than 50 grams per kilometre of CO2 and be capable of driving with zero emissions for 10 miles, or emit no more than 75 grams per kilogram of CO2 and capable of zero emission driving for 20 miles. If it is a hybrid engine with an internal combustion engine, the internal combustion e-bit must meet the Euro 6 standard. The thing about this, unusually, is that this was announced some years ago. Yes. As a result, people have already been working towards this. This is not a new, out-of-the-blue pronouncement. No. It's not an expansion on something. This has been well known. <laughs> This has been well known, and people have been aware of this for some considerable time. So really, it's just a reporting of this is what's happening. This is this took effect on the 1st of January. Everybody knew about it and was kind of in agreement-ish, mm. or at least the major groups were. It meant that on the 1st of January already, 25% of London minicabs, private hire vehicles, were already, uh, already met that. 40% of London black cabs already met that. So a fair chunk and percentage of uh, of vehicles already on the road already met these new standards. Yep. Uh, and just a quick note, talking of uh, expansions unknown uh, or recently dropped on us, the ULES expansion that's going to happen on the 29th of August this year will incorporate a scrappage scheme starting on the 30th of January. And I was quite interested to see that this has included e-cargo bikes as one of the vehicles or transportation options that you can get a grant for if you are scrapping a non-compliant vehicle. So there's a whole new and interesting way of getting run over on the pavements in London. I just wonder when they introduce a licensing system and then start charging people for having an e-cargo bike. Don't go there. <laughs> just don't. Cynical me, cynical, cynical me. Well, we'll uh, get to a story about that very soon because that's not that would not be unique. Do you want to tell us where is the worst place to sit in a car? Yes, it's London. Okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> and that's based on an, in, on an analysis of over a thousand cities in 50 countries and seven continents. And it's by Inrix. Inrix have released their 2022 Global Traffic Scorecard. And it really talks about how long, on average, a driver in the city will be delayed in traffic. Not necessarily sitting still, but will be delayed uh, in traffic. And it's it's not great for London, really. I think no. that's fair to say. So London tops the list. The, they've published the top 25 uh, as part of the free report, the linky in the show notes, etc. So London is top with 156 hours of delay per driver on average that's up five percent from 2021 and up five percent from pre-covid so pre-covid uh, there is a definition of it in the report and it says basically from 20 2019 yeah they've taken year on year uh, and they've also looked well they've actually looked back all four years but they've, they've looked back and and seen what what the percentage changes versus 2019 as a baseline the Average downtown speed in London is 10 miles an hour, and that's down 9% as well. If you want to know the rest of the top 
top couple, I suppose. So London is 156, Chicago, Illinois, 155, Paris, France. But I'm in America, I have to say that now. Paris, France is 138 hours. And then at four is Boston, Massachusetts. Look what you've done, Alan. Hours. I know, you've I've just ruined, ruined the traffic. It. They've it's gone you. from 18th to 4th. Uh, this, but if, if you look at some of these, you can kind of go, well, okay, I understand, what, I understand why that might be the case. Paris, of course, there have been changes in speed limits, uh, all sorts of changes in traffic flows and stuff. Mm. London, obviously, there's been the introduction of many of these speed limited areas, closing off one road. Local traffic networks. Local traffic network, that's the one. Yeah. Uh, the local traffic networks have, have been introduced, so that may well have a, a push there. Uh, here in Boston, then, quite frankly, the much of the public transport system isn't working. So there are issues with the orange line on the T and things like that, which mean that more people and delays on the red line, which means that more people are driving into the city than taking public transport, which they were doing before mm. the um, before. Uh, there's also there's a really interesting report actually because it also looks at business districts as opposed to just the general area. It looks at the most delayed traffic and driving corridors as well it's broken down by continent lots of fun and interesting things if you are nerdy and if you're interested in this kind of thing but they they look at uh, safety as well as cost yeah and as well as the changing in habits of uh, where we travel in the urban areas they call it downtown trips so it's uh, they're talking about uh, people go actually going back on the commute is essentially mm -hmm. what it is and, and how that has changed uh, particularly when you look at the timeline of it towards the end of the year as well, when you yeah. can dig into the reports and you can get into, if, if you're particularly looking at the British side of things, you can see how things have increased towards the end of the year. And I think that really ties a little bit into railway strikes and tube strikes. Yeah. But also there does seem to be an uptick of people going back into the office. Mm -hmm. There is. By the way, the worst bit of traffic road in the UK is the A219 southbound from Fulham Road to Morden Hall Road around about 5 p.m. On average, you'll lose 12 minutes on that 47 hours in total uh, in 2022 stuck on that piece of road. Outside of London, the worst is, the, is in Birmingham. It's the A45 eastbound between Bordersley Circus and Henry Road around 4, 4 p.m. On average, you'll lose nine minutes every day uh, which totals up to 37 hours over the course of the year yep i'm going to continue the city's theme but i'm going to take us to barcelona particularly when i look out the window today <laughs> it was the first time that we met <laughs> and this is the news that barcelona city council are going to introduce what is being described as a pioneering tax to regulate the uh, as is described in this city's today article regulate the use of public space by large e-commerce delivery companies. Now, they are going to add a tax onto uh, it's effectively Amazon. That's what they're calling it. They're calling it the Amazon tax. Yeah, because they're going it's to be not actually called the, the pioneering tax. It's, yeah, because yeah. be, they're going to hit the, the hardest. What they are saying, the economy chief of Barcelona City Council says, we want local traders to have equal fiscal conditions compared to the major e-commerce platforms who have a very high market share. So they're couching it initially as we are fighting for businesses in our city not to be undermined by those who don't have the same uh, the same overheads and the same constraints as people who have bricks and mortar shops in the town. As, lo as local businesses do. Yeah. yeah. But it also goes on to talk about how uh, having this, having so many uh, delivery vehicles actually adds to the congestion of streets. It pollutes the air um, on top of putting local commerce at risk. Now, Barcelona is one of the C40 group, which is a group of cities around the world who are getting together to start making their own regulations and moving quicker than the national governments are in terms of well it, it's originally set up as environmental reasons but obviously scope creep will come into that as they find they can do what they like environmental reasons and taxation reasons do tend to be quite closely linked yes because it seems to be the solution to everything is tax it 
We'll we'll mm. we'll make the planet better by taxing people. Is that is that making it better? I'm yet to be. No, but it makes more tax, Andrew, and yes, that's important. I know. I would imagine the other C thirty nines are watching this with interest. And by the way, London is one of those. Mm. Just do bear this in mind. And this was in it. It's an inevitable thing that will happen. If we are told, don't travel unless you're staying local. Okay, you can travel local, but you need to use an active travel option. And then, you know, it gets pared down and down and down to either walking or a bicycle because they don't like you using a scooter locally now. You have to go further than where you Mm -hmm. can walk. Yeah. Of course, people go, well, I just won't leave. I'll get stuff delivered. So now you're cutting off that option because you're saying that's adding to congestion. I'm still struggling to understand, and I, I've been struggling with that degrowth nature article I retweeted a few weeks ago to understand what people are a- or what these suggestions are aiming to do. Is I fear that it is to just stop us from doing anything, but no one's saying that yet. It's basically if you, you you're aiming for net zero by making everyone uh, live like a serf in the Middle Ages. Base that but that seems to be kind of where it goes. Yeah, it, I mean, I've used that. I ha- I have used the modern Dark Ages term quite a few times, and it does feel like that, and it just worries me. And it, because I'm not because there's no solution to allowing people to live to the same standards they are now. Mm-hmm. without it harming the environment. But no one who is suggesting we need to stop harming the environment is actually being honest with the public and saying that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. It's, it's, I mean, the best way to, to stop harming the environment is just to die, quite frankly. Well, yeah, we need And even people. then, if you could do that quickly, then 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 that would help. We need less... Don't breed. <laughs> oh, sorry, right. I'm well on the way to that one. <laughs> Before we go down the rabbit hole and get too depressed... Can you take us to the first of the, oh God, CES stories? Yes, good news, everyone. Or something like that. In fact, even I don't think it's good news. Qualcomm, according to the register, Qualcomm delivers one automotive chip to rule them all. I mean, even I am sitting here and I'm, I'm you know, I'm not Andrew. <laughs> Um, I, I, I like my toys. You have a more positive outlook on things. I have a more positive outlook on technology. It's me that insisted that there was a CES section in this week's show. But even I can see that if you try to have one chipset, one combined chipset that covers... Don't break your fingers with the inverted commas here. I know, I know, I know. I've got to be very careful. That covers digital cockpit, advanced driver assistance systems, and automated driving in the same architecture. That's possibly not a great idea by giving you a single point of failure. Well, we have been told for years and years. Keep this separate. When it comes to connected stuff, they have to be physically se- separate. You do. They're, and manufacturers have made this big song and dance about, oh no, we we take security and all this very this seriously. Even, so I'm we not even going on the security the, one. I'm well, going it on is the because one. someone will exploit it. Well, <laughs> and talking of single point of failure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They'll have backup options to it. But to have it all in the one place that if you can get in one area of it, then you've going to get in all of it hmm. and it's just nuts but andrew it's cheaper like this it's just one module instead of three or four separate modules therefore it must be better as you said quite rightly and you are the person who has put it best this isn't like me this is not consumer tech this is safety critical tech yeah stop acting like it's consumer tech it's got a really good name though it's called the Snapdragon Ride Flex SOC. SOC standing for System on a Chip, by the way. It's got lots of stuff. It's got a Ride Vision stack. It's all part of the Ride, the Snapdragon Ride platform portfolio. I mean, these are good names. And they seem to have worked on General Motors, Renault, Volkswagen, and BMW. From Mobileye, by the way. Yeah, the uh, thing I was going to say there is the positive is they've moved away from Mobileye, but the bad thing is they've gone to a company that thinks it, it has just ignored safety-critical systems. This is a frying pan. This is the fire. Yeah. Okay, putting this all on it, and it's not that. You know, I'm, I'm, 
I, I, I'm okay with these systems used properly in the correct places and with the appropriate safety things to stop idiots or to try to stop idiots uh, misusing them. You know, that's as good as we, it's as good as we can get. That's okay. I'm okay with that. I do think that combining it all onto one single point of failure is, I'm going to be polite and say foolish to save Andrew's editing. I'm not, I'm not. I think a story two down from this will highlight how foolish this really is. Story two down from this. The last story before the break. Oh, yes, that one. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> yes, there's another story later on which shows how foolish this is. I think that's what you wanted to say, really, isn't yes. it? Yes. So should we move on from this? Because I don't want to go into the details of exactly what's in part of the Snapdragon Ride Flex system on no, the chip. No, let, let's uh, move People on. can link, there'll be link, of course, to the register article in the show notes. You can find out much more and sort of sit and with your face in your hands about that. Yep. To cheer us up, I'm going to talk about how luxury cars are being stolen in 90 seconds with gear that you can buy online for as little as £1,300. Hoy. Once again, may or may not be related to what we've just been talking about. Yeah. There are, thanks to security experts, some of whom we know, uh, there are dozens of cars or dozens of uh, models of cars that have bugs that allow criminals to access the vehicle's controller area network bus or the CAM bus to us peasants and that allow devices to communicate with each other. Criminals are spoofing the communications and allowing them to then access certain parts of the car security system like immobilizers and the locks and the alarms and then they can uh, take the car and run off with them. Unfortunately for one of our friends of the show, Ian Tabor, he has found that out himself as someone uh, did steal his RAV4 from outside his house using this very method. And unfortunately, the advice from manufacturers on how to counter this is to buy one of those huge disc, disc locks lock. and stick it over your steering wheel. Other than that, there's nothing you can do. Did you see another friend Another friend of the show was having a similar challenge with his new vehicle? Because he was like, oh, do I buy one of these disc locks? And everybody said, oh, you probably should. And he went to the manufacturer's own insurance company who said, no, we're not covering that. It's too much of a risk. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, these, you know, gone in 90 seconds. It's, it's yeah. So there is... Uh, a link in the article, uh, link in the show notes to the Times article that talks about this particular incident. And if you can access uh, Mastodon, I've also put a link to something from another friend of the show, Ken Tyndall, where he highlights exactly the sort of thing that is happening to other vehicles and how they're uh, accessing a car, both physically and digitally, to enable a fairly quick and unobtrusive theft really what's what's ken's ken's tip to car manufacturers never can anything that's in you was it pin seven or something of the obd port never connect anything to pin seven of the obd port that can ultimately connect to the internet yeah that's his simplest way for manufacturers to get rid of a lot of a lot of this sort of problem um, however spoofing is slightly different yeah do you want to take us to the last really cheerful story that didn't at all make me angry at all when I read it and then reread it? <laughs> Everyone, we're, we're trying to get all of this anger out of the way before the CES stuff, okay? Otherwise, he might just explode. So there is some logic to this, mostly because I don't want to watch his head just go <laughs> uh, over, over the video. So this last story is about car companies massively exposed to web vulnerabilities. This is not a massive surprise. The articles on portswigger.net, which is not a publication I'm particularly familiar with, but it's pointing out the web applications and the APIs, so the, the sort of interfaces and the conversations that happen between web portals and vehicles and the vehicle support systems of major car manufacturers, telematics, so that's vehicle tracking stuff, fleet operators. It, they're just full of security holes. I mean, that's not a not a massive surprise really this stuff has uh, relied on security through obscurity for a long long time you just can't do that anymore and guess there's a number of vulnerabilities so there's an example 
and particularly where stuff goes from being a web portal to communicating with the vehicle or vehicles. Uh, security researcher Sam Curry and a few of his friends uh, found a vulnerability in the mobile app of a scooter fleet at the University of Maryland. It meant that they could make the horns and headlights of all the scooters on the campus turn on and stay on for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So that sounds but, f- that, that, that so sounds you quite hear that funny. and you go oh that's fun oh that's, that's quite that's, funny there's yes. nothing to that however they, yes there is a however, however moving on from that the same sort of poorly configured API endpoint that was used for generating passwords for the web portals of BMW and Rolls Royce so no high net worth owners there no meant that potentially attackers could take over those accounts so sure it's amusing when it's a scooter network it's less funny when you start to think it was bmw it's rolls royce mercedes-benz had an issue with their single sign-on uh all these kind of things kia with their dealers ferraris web applications all these things uh, yeah the list goes on and on and on and this yeah. is why andrew gets angry with it uh, angry about it it's a really interesting article here basically and this is where it's it's this, this comes into the whole software is hard Volkswagen software company. So you know I'm expecting to not see Volkswagen appear in these kind of things, but again it's making these things obvious. I mean even flipping Twitter. All right, here's one that gets my goat, and I've been doing very well at blocking out the fail whale recently. I, I seem to have managed to just eliminate him, but he tweeted as we're doing a code review the other week, and he wasn't. And what was quite clearly drawn on the whiteboard in the background was a technical infrastructure diagram showing the multiple layers. Here it is. There were protocols written on it. There was all sorts of stuff that, sure, it doesn't give everything away, but it would give any kind of hacker a leg up. Mm. It's just stupid. Just don't do that kind of thing because anything that's exposed to the internet is exposed. Yeah. Sorry. Um. In the show notes, there is a link to this uh, summary article which Alan has talked about, and then there will be a link to the actual uh, report from Sam Curry, and you do need to look through that just to see how many manufacturers, how many suppliers and service providers are actually impacted on stuff that is, when it comes to cybersecurity, really quite basic stuff. This is, this Again, is this is the frustration with it. It's so basic. It's so fundamental that they, it shows that these companies – don't care and don't get someone in to help out. What what gets me is that I sometimes work with manufacturers as part of day job. And obviously I don't talk about them, but podcast because NDAs and stuff. And I know that the kind of hoops that I have to jump through to get access to a system, the system my employer sells which is not mission critical in any way shape or form. It does contain information. It's not connected to anything. It's not going to break anything. And if you know it, you'll know some stuff, but it shouldn't make a huge difference. But I know the hoops I have to jump through for that. And then basically they go outside, undo their flies and and wave everything about on the web to not even customers. Uh, It's quite frustrating from that point of view, from a professional point of view. Yep. And it's one of the reasons why I get all grumpy about it. Yep, absolutely. Let's take a brief pause in my anger and let you tell everybody about guilt minute <laughs> <laughs> right folks it is guilt minute a quick break in the show where we ask for a tad of financial support to keep the lights on and the hosting running if you feel that the poetry podcast is worth a small consideration every month then you can become a patron different levels of patron include different levels of commitment from us to you including being able to watch the show recorded live we also have a small range of merchandise in our spring store from stickers to mugs and t-shirts if you don't have any spare cash and we completely understand, then you can help us by following for free from a podcast player to receive every show as they're released and by liking and rating the show in whatever way your podcast supplier lets you. If you've done all that, and some of you do, so thank you very much, then the last thing you can do is recommend us to your friends or colleagues. Thank you, everyone who does. That was guilt 30 seconds today. Mm-hmm. So efficient with your listening time. Yes, absolutely. Right, let's get started. CES, that happened last week big thing las vegas all the tech people turn up and it now okay. includes automotive right okay whoa, 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 whoa. 
Let's just quickly remind ourselves why CES exists. So the original reason for CES was a way of the manufacturers showing off their new refrigerators to all of the mom and pop uh, hardware stores across the US. And it was held in Las Vegas because it was just after Christmas. And people like to go to Las Vegas because it's sunny. And um, that's what it was all about. And that's what it was about for most of its life. Recently, it has been taken over by the big tech giants trying to show off and wave their bits at people to show off the latest, greatest ideas that are coming forever and ever. And uh, they're definitely coming and these are going to be great. And over the last few years, it's been taken over by car manufacturers. Uh, first of all, it was Ford revealing the Focus Electric. Yes, that was a thing, everyone, uh, some time ago. Uh, and it's grown a little bit since then. What happens is that car manufacturers show off concept cars. Now, we're car people. We're used to the idea of a concept car. We're used to the idea of a concept car showing off stuff which may or may not actually ever make it to production. <laughs> tech journalists are slightly different they get shown something and they go oh my god this is the greatest thing in the world we're gonna have this immediately this is wonderful oh my goodness me this is brilliant and then anything that is shown as a concept seems to be truth and that is the challenge that there is with some of the That's coverage of automotive out, stuff <laughs> on ces is that what is a concept is taken as truth and also it's january there is no other sodding news around. People have to fill websites. They have to generate clicks. They have to fill newspaper and magazine columns. And therefore, it goes everywhere. And people like Andrew explode. <laughs> is that a fair summary? Has that sort of... Covered? It is. It is a perfect summary. So in the show notes will be two articles from Jalopnik that cover both ends of that spectrum. So we have one that is titled CES just became the world's most important auto show. And that's by Tim Stevens, formerly of whatever the Condé Nast car bit was that they've just got rid of. Okay. And then one that is from friend of the show, Ed Niedermeyer, that says, nothing at CES 2023 can solve the nightmare of getting around Las Vegas. Guess which one I sort of lean towards. <laughs> I can't but, possibly imagine. But they're both there for you to see at what CES is all about, but also the reality of what you see at CES. Mm -hmm. Alan, do you want to take us to... So let's start. I'm, I'm going to quickly run off that one because we don't have a separate story on it. So I'm going to take from Tim's. Is the wonderfully named Sony Honda Mobility a feeler? Ugh. If I got one person commenting whenever I said, I wonder how much they paid for that awful name, on Twitter, commenting, I wonder if there's going to be an RS performance version. <laughs> and whether or not there's going to be another version called the Up. That's the highest range and all these things. I mean, it's just really awful. Now, the thing is that this is not expected to come to market for at least three to four years. They <laughs> said themselves, three to four years. And an awful lot can change in that time. So let's just, let's just keep an eye on it. It's also bloody dull. Sorry. And that's going to be a theme that we come back to. It is dull. It is, for me, that is what would be produced if you went to one of these AI chatbot thingies. That, don't get me started oh, on that. Don't you go on that one but as if, well. No, I'm not going on one. But if you put one in and said, please draw me generic modern electric saloon, that's yeah. what it is to me. It is so dull. It is so tedious. And what everybody who's been pant-wetting themselves about this car seems to forget it's got Sony involved, renowned for being superb at security and all the rest of it when it comes to software, talking of re the first part of the show. Not, ju not just that. Also, Sony, either stuff is a massive success or a total and utter failure. And three times out of four, it's a total and utter failure. So I'm still, I still cannot work out. I cannot fathom this, this partnership. I, I, I do not think it's going to work. Let's just all. say it's marginally more real than the Apple car in that they have actually shown a thing and an intent, but I can't say much more. I can't be more generous than that. No. Not even I can be more generous than that. <laughs> and I'm well, the nice one. Yeah. Take us to BMW then. Move us on. <laughs> BMW showed a car that changes color. Uh, it's called the iVision D concept, and, and it previews an all-electric 3 series. If the all-electric 3 Series looks like this, I will be very happy, Bunny, indeed. Obviously, it's going to have door handles. It's going to have wing mirrors. It's going to have bumpers. But I love the form of this thing. 
it just looks great. Obviously, that's not what it's all about. It's all about showing off the tech. Um, so the big thing about this is that it changed color. And I'm told that it was the best looking color changing concept that people have seen. And that's people who have seen many of them. Sorry, that's, that's, a, that's a chart, is it? God almighty. Well, that was a chart by I, I do. Sorry, I that do was just me. That's sometimes. just me who said that. I do that, despair. That's just, no, that was someone saying, actually, it works really well. It's really nice and vivid, even under these bright lights, whereas normally the colors are all muddy. Okay, great. I mean, obviously, it's a concept. It's showing off something. It's the person was not saying that it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. No, no, I no, I get great. that. I get that. I, but... I also don't understand why you want a color changing car. My, my favorite ones are these ones where it says the color will change with your mood. I don't want it. I don't want a pulsing black and purple car. Thank you very much. Well, it's a lie anyway, but anyway. I know it's a lie. Right. I, I, well, I, I, I have to be positive because I'm not going to be very positive for the rest of this stuff. I do like the design. I like the win, cleanness. I, I like the, the fact that it is not made up of swoop slashes and mm -hmm. the silliness that we see at the moment. I like that. Other than that, everything else about this car just made me say, why? So yes, yeah, so the other thing was that of course that that was that the interior is going to have uh, everything's going to be projected and all that kind of stuff. Basically, I, I've got a funny feeling they did at the outside, but they didn't really spend much time on the inside. And just went, yeah, yeah, we'll just make it all sort of projected and cool and heads up display because that means we don't have to really design much more of a dashboard than just some forms. Well, they're talking about this head up display being in there. cars from twenty twenty five, and. Great. Uh, this but is, you still this need a dashboard. is from the same company that said, "Oh yeah, touch screens are going to get banned because they're distracting." And yet you want to, you, yes, but they have one ruined doing... the point of a head-up display, which is it gives you minimal information and allows you to concentrate on the road. You stick it full width, then they will put more info in it. Yes, it's concept car blur. Don't worry. I, I really, I am not concerned about that in in the least bit. What we will see is. Uh, I bet what we'll see is Volkswagen style, that sort of augmented, here's the arrow that shows you which way you turn at the junction stuff. Far more likely that it's going to be that, certainly in the first two or three iterations, and then it will either fade off or it will work by then. Right at the minute, it's a concept and it's an Oh, idea. no, 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 I've got it. I know what will happen. Oh, no. The passenger will have to pay a subscription to see the other half of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move us on to yeah, Peugeot because do. this was uh, another concept which I quite like the look of. I mean, it's not based in any reality, but I like the look of. And this is uh, the Inception concept. And apparently from 2025, Peugeot's will feature a lot of the hints of this in their electric Peugeot's. I'm Well, okay, cool. good luck with I think that. it looks nice. I, 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 I like, I like the design. I like the design. One thing, though, right... I, and I looked at this, and I know it's only a concept, and I know it's. Uh, Is you know, this going to be real. the steering wheel? Steering. How block. are you supposed to see the speedo? Looking how low those seats are, oh, and that's... how high that wheel is, even if it comes down. Oh, Andrew, stop! You are... It's a rendering. It's not even a physical model. I know, but but it's no. At least it's, it's, try it's... and base it in some sort of reality that might make. I make wouldn't. It. I really don't. <laughs> think that that's something to worry about but i like the lines of it i like the design i like the front end i like the back end uh, i very much i like what they've done with the looks okay good that's as positive as we're ever going to get yeah yes i think it looks great anyway right speaking of things which don't look great uh volkswagen also <laughs> unveiled the id.7 well when i say unveiled what they showed was they showed uh, a sort of Imagine a sort of QR code disguise wrap with some rainbow colors underneath where the white bits would be, covering a shape which, at first, certainly at first, in a bit of an advanced study, makes the Sony Honda Mobility Afila look interesting and exciting. Mm. This seems to blend all the uh, panache and style of an ID.3 with all the panache and style of the Mexican built uh, Jetta and Passat. Uh, which you get in North America, meaning that it's a vehicle that, unless there is something amazing happening under there, is going to be missing an awful lot of panache and style. Yeah. This is like, I don't know, what's the what's the dullest EV that there is out there that's intentionally EV? I can't even think of anything. The ID3 is the dullest looking one. 
No, well, I suppose it could be one of the. They're the, all bland. the The ID family is very, very okay. I'll be kind here. Neutral in its looks. Yes, the the, the, the derivatives are much better looking and much rather a Cooper Bournemouth. It does not excite or offend anyone in any way. Well, and that's exactly what you can expect from the ID Seven, but in saloon format. Yes, and supposedly they made a big deal here. The big innovation in the ID Seven is that the slide, the touch sliders below the screen will be backlit and illuminated from behind, so you can see what you're touching, which is a big step up over any of the current ones. Interestingly, this is from the same company that a month ago said we're bringing buttons back into cabins because we've realised we've made a mistake. I think that this was probably designed before that particular yeah, yeah. announcement. I, I know, think. I know. So anyway, there's something to look forward to if you're you know, suffering from sleep deprivation. Okay, final thing then. Yeah, final thing. The, talking the final of thing interiors quickly. which don't excite us. Chrysler don't have, yeah, have shown off their future plans. Uh, guess what it is, everyone? Yes, you're right. Screens everywhere, no buttons. Why? Just uh, I, that. That was my overall thing uh, sentiment from the whole of CES. Was just why? That why have you done that? It does. Does any of that add any excitement or make it better for someone to be driving that car? No. Pretty much in all of those, no. Okay. Uh, the funny thing is that Chrysler, of course, it only makes its money from all the ruggedized things with all the buttons and the, the knobs yeah. and the rubbery bits. The, the Chrysler brand and stuff doesn't, doesn't make money. It's, it's all Jeep. Yeah. So, so it's kind of curious to be showing the... I don't know if that's Chrysler generically or otherwise, but uh, the funny thing is, of course, that Chrysler, you know, Peugeot, we've just said, oh, we quite like that, and the interior there showed loads of buttons and stuff, and of course, it's all Stellantis, isn't it? Yeah. Well, on that on that theme, there was not that it's relevant to us, but there was a Ram electric Ram pickup that people got excited about from Maruka. But it's but, still a couple of years away from from yeah. manufacture. You can already go out here and buy a Ford F one fifty Lightning. The uh, GM platform is is on its way. It's if it's not already launched, I think it's imminent. Yeah, Chrysler are uh, Chrysler traditionally used to lead. They, they they led, or at least they were second, and then GM lagged some way behind. That doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. Uh, Chrysler very much third uh, yeah. from the big three. Yep. Let's go to our recommendations of the week, starting with the lunchtime read, Alan. Well, this lunchtime read is it's been around a little. I, I don't know if it's been around a little while. It's been it's been written by by something that happened a, a little while ago. Uh, it is by friend of the show, Jim McGill. At the also on on Twitter, I'm sure many of you will follow him, and he's talked about driving around Ma Nashville in a Morgan Aero Eight, and it is, it is just nicely written, and it sounds like a lovely way to spend an evening. Quite yes, frankly, so it's at littlefiatadventures.blogspot.com, but you'll find that there's a link in the show notes as always. We will. I'm going to take us to the list of the week, and this list of the week is from Motoring Research and titled 20 Superb Swedish Cars, and it's from the Motoring Research team. Alan, you know what I'm going to ask you? Oh, no, we talked about this before, and it's so and difficult. And this is almost an impossible list to pick one. Do you know I what feel? I like? It is an cool. impossible list. I like the Saab 9000. Okay, that's a good choice. In In pure form... Saab 9000. I know everyone's going to tell me it's a Viet Chroma, but I also like the Alpha 164 and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so, so yes, no, I really like that in, in sort of early turbo form. <laughs> Somebody near here used to have a Carlson, one of those. Oh, it's a bit too many sticky on bits for me. I think it was just a bit too much for the car. That's yes. What the problem was. <laughs> yes. Uh, but no, one of those would be very, very lovely. Nice way to get around, I think. Okay. Right, as there's 20, I'm going to pick one, and I'm going to pick the Volvo 240 because I have very fond memories of it. Before we had the Citroen CX Estate, we had one of these, and one of my abiding memories is us rescuing a pigeon chick because we were renting a house on a farm, and we reared it and everything, and it decided that my dad was its dad. Aww. So it would follow him around, and it would come to see him when he came back from work, and often in the morning my dad would drive off with the pigeon clinging to the aerial 
and he would get some distance from the house, like a mile away, before he decided to let go as he was getting faster and faster. <laughs> so I have very fond memories of the uh, the 240. Very cool. I think they, they were a, a staple of the, well, one of the 740s, a staple of my school car parks. Yeah. We, had a, we had a 940. Ooh. Mm, it was the S, the most basic one with the, the automatic gearbox. It could just about ah. move itself uphill. Almost. Yes. It also had manual locking and windy windows all around. But it still had heated seats. <laughs> all the important stuff sorted. Yeah. <laughs> right, do you want to take us to the end finally then? And finally, it's just really sort of filling in for filling in for the CES ne- negativity here. It's another friend of the show, uh, formerly uh, formerly of Twitter. It is um, Matteo Licata, uh, roads to life on YouTube, uh, and he's got an excellent. Yeah, you're most many of you may know he's an automotive historian. He specialises in Alfa Romeo and the Italian brands, but he's got one out for the secret Alfa, and it's the story of the Alfa Romeo Scarabeo. A well worth uh, all Matteo's Matteo's videos are well well worth a watch mm-hmm. and then listen if only for his accent but also oh, yeah, because he's everything is voice. <laughs> immaculately researched yep do do like and subscribe etc etc YouTube stuff yep uh, that's just about it thanks again by the way to Alex Grant for standing in last yes. week Thank much you very appreciated. Much, it was it was it was excellent. Had a lot of a lot of fun. It was less angry, definitely less <laughs> angry. Oh, as well as that, a couple of special editions out over Christmas. If you haven't listened to them yet, uh, there is one about the Kia EV6 GT line, uh, and also one about the Scion TC and me trying not to get all Andrew and angry about. Uh, <laughs> buying cars in, in the US. Uh, some the other time there'll be, an, there'll be an unedited version uh, <laughs> of my exact feelings on that uh, will come out. But I think that rounds up for the week unless I've missed yep. anything. No. Okay. So folks, don't forget between now and next week you can give us any feedback and share your thoughts on the show at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram on Facebook and on the contact page at motoringpodcast.com the hub of all our activities. Remember you can support us financially via Patreon and please leave a review and rating on Apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such thing. Andrew, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Best way to get in touch with me is a search for Crack Windscreen on Twitter, or if you do, or if you are on Mastodon, then look in Twitter, uh, and in my header info and my bio, you'll find the link to, or the address to that Mastodon account there. And Alan, if people would like to get in touch with you personally, what's the best way to do that? Uh, well, it's best to use Twitter, where I'm at AJP Brad. That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y. Also, same thing. You can use Mastodon as well. Uh, link is in my bio header there, because that seems to be safe-ish to stop you getting banned this For week. Now. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Who knows? Who can tell? It depends on what somebody's been smoking. But irrespective of that, we'll be back soon. But until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring. <laughs>